You may not be familiar with the name George Parker, but I'm sure you're familiar with something that he left all of us. George lived in New York City in the early 1900s, right about the same time that the Brooklyn Bridge first became a part of the New York landscape. Now, the Brooklyn Bridge was, when it opened, known as the eighth wonder of the world. It, for the first time, allowed New Yorkers to move from Manhattan and Brooklyn uh, by foot. And it was quite a nice thing for the society. Now, George Parker's name is forever connected to the Brooklyn Bridge history. But he's not connected by, to the history because he was the architect or the contractor, and he wasn't the mayor of New York at the time. Instead, George is known as one of America's greatest con men. George made his living selling the Brooklyn Bridge over and over again to unsuspecting immigrants who had just cleared Ellis Island. George and his con is where we get that familiar phrase, and if you believe that, I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. Now, I'm not that interested in George and his con for my topic today. I'm really more interested in the people who said yes to George. What was going on in their experience? What was going on in their mind? What was going on in their psychology that led them to believe this was a good purchase decision? Now, you may say to yourself, I would never buy the Brooklyn Bridge. Are you kidding? How can anybody be so gullible, right? And yet, can any of us admit that somewhere along the road, we may have made a bad purchase decision? And this person would probably raise their hand as well. Now, I'm not suggesting that tattoos are a bad decision, not in any way. In fact, the Pew Research Center asked people with tattoos how it made them feel. Here are some of their findings. They found that 29% of those with tattoos reported that the tattoo made them feel more rebellious. Well, not really a surprise. 31% reported their tattoos make them feel more sexy. I was a little bit surprised by that. And then 5%, you can predict this one, made them feel more intelligent. Now, that was a, more of a surprise. The number I really want to look at today is this one, that in the past decade, there's been a 440% increase in tattoo removal. Tattoo removal is big business. I'd like to talk today about purchasing decisions and how maybe we can be smarter about them. And in thinking about this, I... Um, looked at a lot of, re many hours of research. And for weeks, I've looked at all these different studies that have been done. And standard economic theory over many years, over time, has always been that when we make purchase decisions, we do so using logic and rational thinking. Econo I see a lot of heads shaking. Now, economists no longer believe that this is the case. Instead, due to the hundreds of studies by behavioral scientists, we know there's a lot more going on than just logic and reason. And I'd, I've boiled some of these ideas down to share just a few thoughts with you about how we can make better purchase decisions. So I'd like to share some of those with you. And this will not be a surprise to you. When I narrow them down to in a purchase decision, time plays a role. Money and emotion. What may be a surprise is what's going on behind these three things as we make decisions. In each case, I'd like to point out to you heuristics. Heuristics are things that we all use. We've learned to use these over the years. They're mental shortcuts that help make decision-making more efficient and easier, not, so late, not such a hard thing to make a decision. So heuristics, and, they, they, and really, we don't even know they're going on. Let me share a couple quick thoughts. On this notion of time, there's a heuristic called the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is a human tendency to rely, when making a decision, on the most recent information or the most recent experiences we've had. We don't go back through years of, of experiences and do research. We just go on what's most recent and available to our memory. If you were watching the 11 o'clock news on a given night and there was a story in the news of somebody standing on a stage like this and they were getting one of those great big checks and their name is on the check and $350 million, right? They won the lottery. If you saw that in the evening news and then found yourself the next day at the grocery store walking past that counter that sells those lottery tickets, the purchase decision will be, whether you buy one, will be influenced more by that recent experience of watching that broadcast than it is on those years of buying tickets over the years and none of them ever panned out. So the availability heuristic. A second thing, sometimes when we think of 
uh, this notion of time when making a decision, there's a starting point and there's an end. There's a time, a deadline. And in this case, as that time moves on and we maybe have some logic and reason along the way, as we get closer to a deadline, a different heuristic may take over. And that's called the familiarity heuristic, where when we've got all these options and all these things to decide about, it's really easy to fall back on, well, I can't decide just which one's more familiar. You ever find yourself doing that? We go with the familiar versus maybe the best. So in one way, one influence on decision-making, purchase decisions is time. A second one is money. The heuristic that works here is called the anchoring heuristic. Anchoring heuristic, again, is a human tendency to put more weight, more value in the first piece of information we gather or the first piece of information we hear when making a decision. Now, in purchase decisions, that may be a number, it may be a price, or maybe a price range. And it's not always based on logic. Researchers in one study had participants write on a card their last two digits of their social security number. And then they asked them all to think of those last two digits as a price. So think of it not as your social number anymore, now it's a dollar amount. So somebody, if it was 1-7, be $17, 2-8, dollars etc. They then brought in a bottle of wine to the, to the group and said, okay, if that was a dollar amount, would you pay that dollar amount, your last two numbers, would you pay that for this bottle of wine? And they had to consider if they would. Well, then the researchers did one more thing. They said, let's go into a silent auction for this bottle of wine. And you can probably predict what happened. Those who started their bid higher had that number that was the social number that was a higher number. And so it related that anchor, that first number, completely unrelated, unrelated to this purchase, influenced their starting bid on that bottle of wine. An uh, the anchoring heuristic, we all have a tendency to do that. So be careful on that first number that may be thrown out. And that could be uh, influence how we perceive the value of something. The last heuristic I'd like to share with you is about emotion. Now, this could be a topic all in itself. And maybe you've seen a topic on uh, how the emotional role, the emotions, how they play a role in decision making. In purchase decision, decision making, there's one called the affect heuristic. The affect heuristic is simply says that when we feel good, we may place less risk on an upcoming purchase. And when we feel bad or negative in some way, we put more risk in whatever it is that we're looking to buy. Uh, and that heuristic, that affect, can be influenced by something as simple as sunlight. Don't we all feel better when the sun is shining than when it's raining? One researcher correlated and found a positive relationship between the amount of sunlight measured in a given day and stock market performance. And that was across 26 countries. Sunlight has a role. Another thing could be irritation. So that even a minor irritation of a traffic jam or somebody cutting you off on the road can, can spill over into our purchase decision making. And so the reason in anger is even a deeper effect, where in anger, a lot of our decision making part of the brain simply shuts down. We can't evaluate information. We can't evaluate even advice. So these three influences are real. They play an effect on us all. And, um, and so be aware that there's more going on. Now, I've, I've looked at this and I thought to myself, what happens, though, when the plot thickens? What happens when you're not alone? This is largely just us making decisions. What happens when a salesperson is present? What happens when there's a salesperson involved in helping you make that decision? So I thought, why don't I do some primary research for this piece? And I thought, I'm going to do a, you know, survey monkey and do it all across North America or maybe the world, get really aggressive. And I thought, well, I go through all that trouble. I'll just go to the source, somebody who knows how to buy, somebody who loves shopping, and that's my wife. <laughs> and so I walked into my kitchen and I said, Renee, when you're shopping for something, whatever it is, do you believe what salespeople tell you? And she thought for a moment. She said, well, I don't, maybe. And she thought, well, let me give you an example. If I was to go out and try to buy a pair of shoes, and I tried those shoes on, and the salesperson said, oh my gosh, those shoes look great, and you got to buy those shoes. She said, I probably wouldn't buy them just because that salesperson was too excited. And I said, oh, all right, well, that makes sense. I started to walk away. And then I thought, wait a minute, there's one more question I have to ask. What if that same salesperson said, no, those shoes don't look good? Then would you buy them? She said, well, no, I don't want to buy shoes that don't look good on me. 
And there's a lot to this. I had to put it on a slide. It was so important because, yes, the salesperson says those shoes look great. It equals no sale. No, they don't look good. It equals no sale. What does Renee to do? How does she make a selection? So I'd like to look deeper at this and share with you a model you can use to evaluate and think about how salespeople impact your decisions. And so to do this, I'm drawing from a study done by Amy Cuddy. Amy Cuddy is a social psychologist with Harvard Business School, and her research, in one piece of her research, she wanted, she wanted to learn how do we assess people in a first impression. So when we meet somebody the first time, what goes through our mind to assess them? And she found that we do this on a subconscious level in two levels, two dimensions. The first is warmth. And the second is competence. And warmth, she describes, beyond just likable, am I agreeable with this person, it's really more about intention. Is this person I'm meeting for the first time, is their intention to help me or to harm me? Are they here to help me in a purchase decision? It may be, are they here to assist me in what I'm trying to get, or are they just trying to make a sale? And then competence in her study is simply how competent is that person to carry out their intention? And I looked at this, I thought, this is pretty good. I'm going to extend her research beyond what she had thought about and apply it to thinking of salespeople in this situation. So let's extend her study and look at it this way. So if we have low and high, low and high, when you meet someone and you can uh, pretty quickly identify that they're on their own page, not yours, in a purchase decision, right? Low warmth, and maybe you don't even like them, and they really don't have a lot of confidence. Maybe they're new in what it is they're representing. You might just avoid that salesperson. Go to a different store, different dealership, try something else. Avoid. How about up here? So you find at, in first impression and beyond that they're likable. They seem like they care about what we're trying to buy and yet they just don't have any competence, not just in their intention, competence in carrying out their intention, but competence even in what they represent. And they don't know, they can't really help us in how it applies to us. In this instance, you may choose to use caution because your likeness for them, your liking them may influence your decision and they may be giving you bad or incomplete advice. So use a little caution. You may have to do a little more work, do some of your own homework here. What about when somebody has all kinds of competence, right? I mean, they know their product or their service. They know how to help you. They know how you, this purchase applies to your life. They have experience. They're really good. And yet, you, you have a pretty good sense they're trying to make a sale. Their intention is not focused on us. What do you do in this instance? I recommend you use them for their expertise and move on. What happens, now you know where I'm going with this. Quadrant two, right? Great, uh, great focus on us truly helping, trying to help us make a good choice, and they know their stuff. This is the box where you're going to want to connect. Connect. This is where you want to be, and this is where all of us as purchasers become loyal customers. When we have a salesperson in this box, we become loyal. We do repeat business. We also give our friends and family referrals. Say, hey, I, if you're in this market for something, this is the person to go to. So use this model because it can really help you to think about how to uh, interact with a certain salesperson. Now, where do these two, where do these two pieces of thought, where do these two models come together? Usually we think to ourselves, it's not uncommon to think that salespeople are at odds with us trying to make a purchase, that we have competing goals. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can mirror each other in trying to make a transaction where we both benefit. And so where do they make the best connection? Well, guess what? When the dollar amounts are significant, when our deadline is fast approaching and the emotions are high, where are we in this chart? It, it's right here. And who do we want to have on our corner helping us make this decision? Now, when these are in alignment, you set yourself up for success. Use these models in your next purchase. Some of you may be looking to buy some real estate. Maybe you're going to buy a car, maybe a tattoo. Whatever the case, use these to set yourself up for success. Because if there's not alignment, you may find yourself buying a bridge. 